Hello, today I thought I'd take a look at uh, 10 more books that I think are essential reading for serious students of World War II. And today I'm going to look at 10 books that deal exclusively with the Eastern Front, the contest between Germany and Russia that began on June 22, 1941 with uh, Hitler's unleashing of Operation Barbarossa. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and name 10 of these books. Now again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many, many books dealing with this subject. These are 10 that I think, again, uh, I would be willing to put on a uh, graduate reading list and some of them I would for sure include on a, in a graduate leading, uh, readings course. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, these are in no particular order, but I'm going to start with The War of Annihilation by Jeffrey McGergy. Um, this is a book that it's, it's a synthesis. Uh, McGergy is looking at other sources here, other secondary sources, but he's putting them together and he's, and he's making some very astute observations. Notably that the Wehrmacht was never really designed to um, well, that is to say, it, none of, its strength wasn't logistics, its strength wasn't supply, its strengths tended to be more toward things like operational, um, just operations in general, but in you know, things like intelligence and in supply, <clears throat> the Wehrmacht was woefully inadequate. And so consequently, when they invade the Soviet Union, the orders are given that uh, the German army needs to live off the land, essentially rob from the peasants and anybody else, whatever it needs. Now this is a this is a recipe for disaster since the Germans, of course, have all this racial baggage they're taking, this, this racism that, that kind of fuels their wars of expansion. So you kind of marry this logistical need to live off the land, rob from people, with this kind of view of the Soviets as Untermenschen, and it's, as I say, it's a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> And so consequently, um, the people in Russia suffer significantly from the German invasion here. And again, uh, you know, as Victor Davis Hanson mentions in the Second World War, you really do need to look at the Second World War as a war of the, uh, of the German and Japanese governments against unarmed civilians. And that's very much the case here in, in Russia with Barbarossa. And McGergy makes a very strong case for just how that was kind of intertwined, deeply ingrained in kind of the German plan of action in 1941. Very good book, War of Annihilation from Jeffrey P. McGergy. And McGergy, unfortunately, just recently passed away. He was still a fairly young guy. It was very tragic. I was very sorry to hear of his passing. He also wrote some very other good books as well. Next, I'd like to discuss The Road to Stalingrad from John Erickson. And you could easily put his, his kind of follow-up to that, The Road to Berlin, in here as well. But uh, The Road to Stalingrad is probably one of the most exhaustive books on the Soviets and, and essentially the Soviet war effort and how the Soviets were um, kind of gearing up, mobilizing themselves to, to, to fight this war. Um, this is, a, of course, it shows the, the um, it illustrates just how Stalin takes a much more active role in the war. Um, you know, up until I think right before the war broke out uh, in 1941, Stalin never held a government job. He was always the chairman of the Communist Party, the, the general secretary of the Communist Party and de facto leader of the Soviet Union, but it's not until right before um, Barbarossa that he actually takes on <clears throat> government duties uh, in order to uh, kind of give him more, more power uh, going forward and meeting a crisis of a potential war, then a war breaks out, and he, you know, accrues more power around him to, to deal directly with that war. He talks about the Soviet mistakes that they made with the generals, Stalin's disastrous uh, counterattacks um, right after the, the German felt invasion to take Moscow in early 1942, uh, how he was pushing for those attacks and how the, the fact that the Germans didn't back down and the Soviets kind of didn't know what they're doing because the Soviet leadership had been uh, decapitated by Stalin. Uh, in the 1930s during the purges. <clears throat> it, it's all covered very well and it's all handled very well. John Erickson's <clears throat> The Road to Stalingrad is fantastic. Uh, then of course, like I said, with The Road to Berlin, the second book in the series, he, he does a second part of the book after Stalingrad, and hits Kursk and all those high notes too. So John Erickson's The Road to Stalingrad, very good book. Next is another book that deals a lot with the Soviet uh, war effort. And this is Absolute War by Chris Bellamy. Now, Bellamy's uh, attitude is, you know, we've talked about total war and the idea of total war and the idea that, um, uh, you know, you, you mo completely mobilize a society to support the war effort, which this kind of thinking has its roots back, you know, as early as the French Revolution with the levee en masse. 
but of course it's Ludendorff that kind of in, in Germany in World War One that kind of gives enunciation to that idea of total war of uh, mobilizing every resource of the state t toward war. And Chris Bellamy says, well, the Soviet Union, World War II, even takes it further with, uh, with absolute war, meaning um, not only is every resource mobilized, but every person is mobilized in a way that had never been done before in order to meet the crisis of the German invasion there in 1941. And again, he makes a very good argument. <clears throat> he also talks, too, just kind of about, uh, you know, logistically, uh, what he calls the cone of Europe. You know, how Europe from from France to, to Russia actually kind of looks like a cone. And that means as, as the Germans are going one way, they're spreading out further and further. Their supply lines are getting out further and further. And when the Soviets counterattack, their supply lines kind of are, are going in. And he talks about how this too, I mean, it's a very simplified way I'm presenting it here, but, but he talks about how that was an important factor too in kind of how the Germans really didn't have the power to take the Soviet Union and how ultimately the Soviets were able to counter counter uh, that blow from the Germans and were able to, to turn it back on the Germans and eventually invade Germany and take Berlin. Um, very good book. Again, another book about just really talking about how far the Soviets um, mobilized themselves and their, their, their citizens to fight the Germans. So Absolute War from Chris Bellamy. Robert Satino's Death of the Wehrmacht, uh, Death of the Wehrmacht, The Campaigns of 1942, I believe it's subtitled, uh, is another very good book. This book is... Um, kind of makes the case that in 1942, the, 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 the Wehrmacht, through various reasons, begins to fall apart. Um, you know, and he cites several things here. He talks certainly about Hitler's increasingly inept leadership um, when it comes to, to directing his armies, but in, in his increasing micromanagement um, that, that occurs. And, you know, there had always been the German tradition of uh, uh, Auftrag's tactic, which was um, mission orders, essentially the idea of you, you would give a subordinate commander a very, very vague, well, I shouldn't say vague, but, but a very non-specific uh, way to go about their mission. For instance, uh, you would say, you know, a general would say to a subordinate general, I want to have dinner in that town tomorrow night, meaning you know what the objective is, the town, and you know the time limit by tomorrow night. And then it was up to that subordinate commander to kind of come up with, a, with an operational plan and then execute that plan to, in order to take the, the um, objective. And Hitler, of course, with his micromanagement, kind of revokes that, 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 that time-honored practice of the German oppression army. And uh, that was a contributing factor. He, you know, but he, he talks about the um, uh, Erwin Rommel, for instance, and how aggressive he was and how perhaps that was not a good thing at times. He should have been a, played a more cautious game at times. Um, but the fact that he was just attack, 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 you know, it's one of those things that sounds great, but in reality, you, you, you kind of have to, to, to look at, you, you have to look at the operational realities. And perhaps Rommel would have been better suited to, to play a more conservative game at times. And, and, and Zatino makes that point as well. Um, you look at it, of course, the, you know, the, 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 the destruction of the Sixth Army, the beginning of the destruction of the Sixth Army at Stalingrad, and then of course the defeat at El Alamein. And, and really late 1942 is, is kind of you know, a major turning point in the war or at least the beginning of a major turning point in a war. And Satino kind of shows well, why that was, why, what decisions, both, both kind of strategic and operational, were being taken to ensure that the Wehrmacht was not going to recover from, from what happened there in late 1942. Very good book. Um, I actually had the pleasure to meet Dr. Satino at the World War II Museum uh, last year, last December. Heck of a nice guy, really a super nice guy. And uh, it's a great book. And I've, I've read a few books by uh, Satino, and, and uh, they're all worth reading. Everything he writes is worth reading. This one is uh, very good for our purposes here today. That is Death of, a Wehrmacht by, Death of the Wehrmacht by Robert Satino. Next up is When Titans Clashed by David Glantz. Glantz is a very good scholar of the Soviet Union and the, the Red Army under Stalin. And he kind of he he, he kind of makes a uh, a very good case here. Uh, you know, we we kind of the popular conception is that as the war went on, Hitler increasingly micromanaged the war, which which he did, of course. But there's almost this perception Stalin kind of became more hands off as the war progressed. Um, you know that he you know those counterattacks in 1942, he learned something and he kind of steps back and kind of hands more power to his technocrats. And that's only partially true. He doesn't really become hands off. He still becomes very much on top of things, but he does listen to his generals. He lets his generals make their case more than they had, uh, and, and he does listen to that advice. I mean, certainly he did at, at uh, Stalingrad in late 1942 with Operation Uranus, and he, so 
it, it kind of, it, Glantz kind of dispels that, that idea of Stalin being hands-off. He's still very hands-on, but he, I guess, works better with his generals. And it's more of a, uh, there's more of a back and forth with his generals than was happening in the German camp with Hitler becoming, as I say, increasingly a micromanager. And that's very good. Now, I should warn you, Glantz is not easy to read. Glantz is, he's kind of one of those authors that you kind of read against the text. I don't think he's a, I think he's a very good historian. I don't think he's a particularly good writer. And that's um, very true of a lot of good historians, unfortunately. Um, I mean, he's not a horrible writer. He's not the worst writer I've ever read. But he, I mean, just be, bear in mind, if, when you read his book, um, it's probably not one you want to start with. He, he He's great for, for, for what the information you want to you want to get from him, but just for a more casual reader, I don't know that this is where you want to start. But nevertheless, it's a book filled with information. That's when Titans Clash from David Glantz. Next up is a book that is a kind of a collection group biographies um, of Stalin's generals, appropriately titled Stalin's Generals by Harold Shuckman. This is a good book. It kind of details um, the various, uh, it's, it's written by different uh, the different profiles of generals are written by different historians. It's edited by Harold Shuckman. And this is good because it, it illustrates the, the various generals that actually participated in this war and um, kind of what they, what they contributed, what they um, brought to, to, to Stalin. Some of the highlights, I think, was um, discussing Rokozovsky, who had, who had been um, sent to a Siberian camp during the purge. Um, then, of course, when the Germans invade, they need experienced officers, so they pull them back, and Rokozovsky meets with Stalin, and Stalin's like, oh, Rokozovsky, where have you been? As though he hadn't signed the order sending him to a gulag. Um, but it's very good, and it, and it you know, shows the, of course, illustrates the rivalry between Zhukov and Konyev at the end of the war, as they were both racing for Berlin. <clears throat> but just a lot of good personal details. Um, more Shapishnikov. Um, learned a lot about this guy who was a, a career czarist officer uh, who was one of the few that kind of successfully transitions from, from the czar's army to the, uh, to the Red Army uh, after the revolution. And he, of course, becomes chief of staff and a very, very important figure in the Soviet war effort. Um, an interesting guy, uh, Vasilevsky, of course, is one of the staff officers, uh, uh, one of the guys who helps to design Operation Uranus against Stalingrad. Very good background on all of these guys. And so this is a very interesting book to read from the general's perspectives. Of course, um, Corelli Barnett had, had, had edited a, a book, a similar book about uh, uh, Hitler's generals. John Keegan edited a book about Churchill's generals, and all these collections are very good reads. Uh, but I, I do particularly enjoy this one about Stalin's generals because I didn't know too much about these guys going into it, and I learned a heck of a lot. So that is Harold Shuckman is the editor of Stalin's generals. Next up, um, another one from a, from a historian that I just absolutely admire tremendously, and this is Richard Overy's uh, Russia's War. Again, this is another one-volume book about kind of how Russia mobilizes for war. It's a book about, well, not just mobilize for war, but prosecutes the war. Um, but it, it, it's a book that, it's not a very long book, and it's a very readable book. But he, Overy goes into um, quite a lot of detail for as, for as you know, short a book as this is. Um, it, he kind of covers some of the same ground that Erickson does. Uh, with his and, and Bellamy, but he does it with such, you know, Overy's one of those authors that just, you know, on every page you're learning something new and you're getting something new out of it, and he does it very, very well. Um, this book, I, I wrote, when I wrote my master's thesis, um, and a lot of these books were, uh, you know, I cited in my master's thesis, but Overy's book was kind of, kind of my Bible. It was kind of my go-to book if I had any questions, I, 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 I could look it up, and Overy usually had, had covered quite a lot, so I really appreciated that. Um, but it's just a, a fascinating book of, of Russia, um, again, how, how the, the Stalin organizes his government, organizes his, his military in order to meet the threat, and then, of course, the sacrifices of the Soviet citizens and the Soviet peoples in, in countering Hitler's uh, invasion. Tremendous book. That is Russia's War by Richard Overy. Next up is a book that kind of shows what life was like for Soviet soldiers, the average Soviet soldier. And this is Catherine Meridale's um, Ivan's War. And, and Ivan's War, you know, appropriately enough, Ivan, kind of a generic term for the Russian soldier. Um, but she does a very good job in illustrating just what 
life was like for for these guys um, you know where they came from what they were doing and she does cover you know she does touch on on, on some of the generals Timoshenko and, and Shapishnikov and some of these other guys and where they came from but really fundamentally it's about the average soldier it's and it's about their experience in the war and she does a fascinating job of of presenting what the war was like from that perspective um, Again, when I was reading, when I was writing my, my master's thesis, this is you know, 10, 11 years ago, um, this book had just come out and it was, it was again, it was very illuminating. Um, and, and it reminded you, you know, wars aren't all just about generals and maps. And I mean, it's about the guys that are out there suffering and fighting and dying um, for their homes. Very good book, uh, Catherine Meridale's Ivan's War. Next up is a book by Timothy Snyder called Bloodlands. Bloodlands is a book about uh, um, literally the land in between Berlin and Moscow. Um, that's kind of his thesis that <clears throat> most of the killings that take place not just over the course of the war, but also in the sense of both the Nazi and Soviet regimes just committing acts of murder, um, occurred mostly between Berlin and Moscow in those areas. And he does a fine job of, you've got these two regimes who are committed to creating uh, social perfection in their countries. The Soviets based on kind of the classless society and the Germans based on a, a racial hierarchy, hierarchical society. And they were so uh, committed to, to uh, these visions, these horrific apocalyptic visions that um, they felt compelled, they felt justified in the murder of millions of people. So this book does discuss the war, it discusses the war, but it also discusses these other crimes, certainly the Holocaust, the Germans mass murdering Jews and other undesirables in, in, in death camps in Poland. Um, and then you also have the Soviet atrocities that occur here, um, you know, the NKVD, you know, murdering you know, the, the Polish, um, uh, 20,000 Polish officers after uh, they invaded Poland in 1939. Um, the uh, you know evacuation of uh, of cities and instead of evacuating the prisoners, they would just you know put oftentimes put bullets in the backs of their heads. Um, so there's just a lot of uh, it was, this is a grim book. It's a hard book. He also Sander also touches on the famine, uh, the, the the kind of man-made famine that Stalin created in the Ukraine to um, feed the cities and pay for industrialization while literally these people in, in the Ukraine were just starving to death um, because the government was just taking all of their food. It's, again, it's just, it, it's horrific and it reminds you just how brutal it was and, and it's terrifying to think this was not that long ago. You know, my parents were alive when this was going on. They were born in the 30s and it's just, it's chilling. It's absolutely chilling. So um, another fantastic book. This is Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder. Finally, uh, I want to talk about a book called The Myth of the Eastern Front by Ronald Smelser and Ed Davies. Now, I should point out that I was, when I got my master's degree, um, I was studying with uh, Dr. Smelser um, and Dr. Davies and, uh, at the University of Utah, and they, uh, they actually let me look at some chapters while I was working on my, on my thesis. But this is a fantastic book because... Um, the, the subtitle is The, um, the, the um, American Perceptions of the Nazi-Soviet War. And really this is what it's about. It's about how history can be manipulated for different purposes. Really, um, what, what we're seeing here is how, in this book, what they detail is how Americans went from seeing the Germans as the enemy, as the Nazi uh, thugs that ran Auschwitz and goose-stepped for Hitler, uh, into our allies, and we had to have that psychological shift because during the Cold War, um, we needed the Germans in NATO, we needed their manpower, we needed their experience in fighting the Soviets, and so we made kind of a number of moral compromises. And the book does a very good job of showing how generals, you know, they wrote their memoirs and how those memoirs um, uh, kind of influenced our perceptions of how the the Germans fought that war. Um, the idea of the, the the myth of the clean Wehrmacht, meaning the German army was honorable, it was just the SS thugs that were committing atrocities on the Eastern Front. We know that's not true. The the Wehrmacht was up to its eyeballs in civilian blood on the Eastern Front. Um, I think it was uh, General Manstein kind of made a big 
stake during his trial about how he was constantly fighting with the uh, with the Wehrmacht um, or with the SS, um, and the impression he gave was that he didn't want to give lone men to the SS to uh, to commit these atrocities. But in fact, they were just arguing over when and how they were going to get him back. He wasn't arguing on moral grounds that they shouldn't be used for such purposes. In fact, most of the German generals were absolutely thrilled to have the SS in their rear areas, policing the rear areas, uh, because that freed them up to have more men at the front, which you know sounds well and good, but they all knew they weren't just policing the rear areas. They were actively murdering Soviets, Jews, and other undesirables. Um, but the book also talks about other ways in which uh, these things were um, kind of watered down after the the uh, World War II and into the Cold War, <clears throat> and how you know you got historical recreationists today. They talk about how you have you know many many historical recreationists that like to dress up like Germans and few that like to play the role of the Soviets. You also talk about how there are um, many many uh, war games that would kind of highlight the war from the German point of view. Um, a lot of other things that, that, that people did, to, as I say, to kind of make that, that psychological leap that the Soviets were the enemy now and the Germans were our friends, and that involved whitewashing history. Very good book, The Myth of the Eastern Front by Ron Smelser and Ed Davies. So that's just 10 more books uh, I thought I'd share with you. I think you might enjoy if you get a chance. Please check them out. Um, please let me know what you think in the comments, if you've read these books or if you haven't, or what other books you would put on a list like this. I'd be very eager to hear that. Please leave that there. Please go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I'll try to put out some more content like this in the future. And also, if you do like gaming, please check out my other YouTube channel, The Discriminating Gamer, where I do talk about board gaming, sometimes war games, and uh, we have a lot of fun there as well. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.